um, her interest is in uh, research on writing technologies and digital cultures, transdisciplinarily. Um, so she has looked at different kinds of media historically and theoretically. And um, she, I think, came across this interest through her um, studies as a young student at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she got her BA in 1975, and then with a short detour to the University of Chicago, back to the University of Santa Cruz for her uh, PhD, which she received in 1987. And at uh, Santa Cruz, she studied with Donna Haraway um, and wrote about constructions of poetry, drawing on some of the science studies literature to talk about textual and ed editing its relation to feminist political activism. Her books are Theory and its Feminist Travels, Conversations in U.S. Women's Movements, 1994, and more recently, um, Speaking with things and introduction to writing technology. So oh, that's the one I'm going that's to be the writing. One, sorry, you're going this to is the one I just did. I yes. brought it with oh, me. Oh, great. So this is the yeah. one she just finished, 2011, Network Reenactment Stories, Transdisciplinary Knowledges Tell. And then, so what I just mentioned um, is the work that's in progress. And I think this, this is going to be a piece of it. Right. So what yeah. we're going to hear about today is a piece of it. And it's uh, titled In Knots, Thinking With and About the Andean string and not recording device called the Yeah, so, um, so just to give you a sense of this, um, this is really, in many ways, the beginning of a project, and it's had several sort of aborted starts and stops. Um, what you're hearing now is going to be the introduction, or at least as a draft of an introduction to the book Speaking with Things. And in that sense, the Kipu is both an introduction to the idea of writing technologies. It uh, calls into question some of the sort of um, assumptions that we have about what counts as writing. And also, it is itself a demonstration of what transdisciplinary knowledge can be about. So in fact, I think we are actually, as a group here, a demonstration of that too. So transdisciplinary knowledge is about knowledge worlds that have different things to say to each other. They may focus around things, like the kipu. Sometimes certain things seem to belong to some knowledge worlds more than others. But transdisciplinary knowledge kind of requires us to think relatively about who gets to feel like they have extensive inspections of a whole area and context, or which are the communities of practice with intensive meanings and desires. So I actually rather hope that we actually exemplify both of these things, like people who have intensive investments in a particular way of looking at the people and other people who, and together with, at the same time, that we have ways of uh, connecting together around transdisciplinarity and how we share and distribute these knowledges. Before we start, though, I'd like to mention that tonight there's going to be a fabulous transdisciplinary performance by one of my colleagues, uh, Jeffrey McCune, called the Black Museum. I'm going to pass this around for people to look at, too. So there's a, a, a handout for this talk. And what you've got, what you see up here is the website that I created to go with the talk. And nowadays, this is what I do with all my talks. So it has an overview, it has the slides, and, and the handout are actually all online here. And you can go and look at various contexts. There's a section on media in which you can look at um, uh, some uh, clips and uh, videos and various materials. And there's a, a modestly extensive bibliography. Pieces of this are on the handout as well. And the handout has the URL for this. And we'll post it on the last blog post page. What page are the Now, I was going to work off of the slides here, but quite frankly, they're not really large enough for you to see. So I'm going to use the slides that are in PowerPoint, because they're just a little easier to see. Um, so 
So I, I really thank you for inviting me. And this is one thread that goes through three decades of research on writing technologies. It kind of comes through at a certain point. This is something that keeps getting re-entangled into what I do. So at different moments, the Kiku has different things to reveal about writing technologies. Um, and the transdisciplinary work that I do reshapes what a Kiku counts as, even. What we're thinking of it as. Um, I'd say you could that it's spun anew with rapid and dramatic changes in research. And just in the last two years, there have been some amazing new discoveries of Kiku boards, which could be some sort of Rosetta Stone for Kiku, and I'll mention that in a little while. Or, about five years ago, there were major new excavations that found Kiku in situ that were unfound before. So you've got, just in the last 10 years, some really quite dramatic changes in the research apparatus and the base of knowledge. Um, so these are shifting contexts, and they, they, the contexts themselves are part of what we look at in this kind of transdisciplinary work. So this thoroughly transdisciplinary something is a kipu, which means not in Quechua. And it is not only my imagination that has been engaged, but that of many others across knowledge worlds, within and beyond globally restructuring academies. And when I look at transdisciplinary knowledge, I want to see the site of knowledge production. So today the academy has part of restructuring economies, and this is part of what my new book is about. Um, and uh, we might say that this talk is about how we are affected by the Kiku. That is to say, we find sharing worlds with Kiku to be altering our sensory apparatus across materialisms and actually adding elements to worlds and embodiments we both know and that we can say caringly are emergent. Kipus are, kipu are things in the sense joked about by Bruno Latour, who said, facts are no longer the mouth-shutting alternative to politics, but what has to be stabilized instead. And you'll see that kipu are highly unstable. Um, to use another etymology, objects which have been conceived as wholly exterior to the social and political realm have become things again that is in the sense of the mixture of assemblies, issues, causes for concerns, data, lawsuits, controversies, which the words race, causa, shows, atya, ding have designated in all the European languages. Sharing worlds with people, we find ourselves having to unlearn as well as to learn. Now, thoroughly altered myself by writing technological infrastructures processes, and cognitive reassembly. When I share my work, I tend to do so as a kind of transmedia story. A story that both you and I gather together and pin together across media, platforms, sensory channels, and forms of sharing. And this is my Pinterest site about it. So, as I said, I showed before this website that I created that you can look at that you've got the URL on the handout. Um, this is to accompany the talk, but really it was also a kind of sandbox for thinking it out as I prepared to come today. And I use the web as a set of sandboxes, or maybe better knowledge weavings, for intellectual play for all of my work nowadays. Such play helps me think in pictures to move around and interconnect knowledges distributed among worlds, to talk to myself and others both verbally and non-verbally. My website concentrates this talk today. It has links for overviews. It links to more context for how it fits into the range of work I do, but it collects links to other work on the web each picture is also a link. 
and that the website shares multimedia, videos, slides, my handout, Google Books, it stores a bibliography. It has many links here for further attention after today. You can engage a transdisciplinary extensive range and you can explore intensive communities of practice and their very specific needs too, link by link. And this is a transmedia form that modestly makes knowledges as well as sharing and demonstrating them, storing and using them. It is not at all a transparent platform for content, but rather, as feminist theorist Donna Haraway reminds us about speculative feminisms of all kinds, quote, it matters what matters we use to think other matters with. It matters what stories we tell to tell other stories with. It matters what knots, not knots, what thoughts think thoughts, what ties, tie ties. It matters what stories make worlds, what worlds make stories. So notice that you have the handout too. It's also downloadable from the website. Quotations and bibliography, it shares the link. I am, I both talk about and am myself a transmedia storyteller. So nowadays I find myself in knots. As ethnomathematician Gary Erton, he's the guy who won a MacArthur Award in 2001 for demonstrating that thinking of Hebrew as if they used computer machine language allows us to understand across time just how much information such past forms of binary coding might have been able to hold. As Gary Erton and Kipu database administrator and web designer, textile historian, and anthropologist Terry Brazeen say on the online database that hopes to collect for worldwide scholarly attention the material details of all known across museums and collections, and shares with a range of publics why this might all matter. As Erton and Brazine tell us at that website, quote, the word kipu comes from the habitual word for not, denotes both singular and plural. Kipu are textile artifacts composed of cords of cotton or occasionally camelid fiber. The cords are arranged such that there is one main cord, called a primary cord, from which many pendant cords hang. There may be additional cords attached to a pendant cord. These are termed subsidiaries. Some kipu have up to 10 or 12 levels of subsidiaries. Kipu are often displayed with the primary cords stretched horizontally so that the pendants appear to form a curtain of parallel cords, or with the pendant cord in a curve so that the pendants radiate out from their points of attachment. When kipu were in use, they were transported and stored with the primary cord rolled into a spiral. In this configuration, kipu have been compared to string knots. So how could these things possibly be binary? What does that mean here? Well, first, by starting with understanding Andean social and conceptual systems as radically dualistic. Situations, for example, in which, say, a common person might wear a tunic worn from yarn spun Z or, uh, and plied S or, and clock or clockwise, and plied S or counterclockwise. Well, a popular shaman might wear a tunic woven from yarn spun S and apply Z. So those are the two relations of the kind of cord yarn. On the left hand of this slide is the schematic of the seven-bit binary code that Erton theorizes that the Kipu uses, taken from his book, Signs of the Inca Kipu. He calculates that this system could manipulate 1,536 unique units, comparable to the sign capacities of early cuneiform, 
Shang Chinese ideograms, and Egyptian and Mayan hieroglyphics. Seven types of information are coded in binary bits. The material that a string is made from, the color class of each string, its spin-fly relationship, how it is attached to other chords, what S or Z direction the knot is tied in, which of two number classes it belongs to, and which of two kinds of Hebrew string it might be, either one for recording numbers, or, Erton theorizes, one used to record histories, poetry, other ritual, canonical narrative forms. This is all very speculative. On the right-hand side is the binary signature of one knot on a Hebrew, showing how the seven-bit code could be used. It was in the context of research on historical and cross-cultural writing technologies that I first learned about and not all that long ago, considered by academics to be counting and not writing. In some ways, the very thing that distinguished what we meant was the edge of writing, what wasn't writing. So what counts as writing, as counting, as connecting or disconnecting them? Restructuring knowledge systems in the 90s and after create contexts, economies, critical design, speculative feminisms, technology infrastructures, new excavations, new historical knowledges like the Hebrew boards, for cascading forms of attention and frames of analysis for alternative Hebrew speculation at different grains of detail. The Hebrew is both something to think with and something to think about. Hebrew knowledges today are created, shared, demonstrated, used, and stored in many writing technological forms. Not only academic monographs, books, conference talks, but also websites, databases, images, exhibitions, reenactments, television documentaries, tourist and heritage tours, sites and festivals, as well as village and kinship ritual work processes. Gender and nationality, ethnicity and race, indigenous politics and university restructuring are all playing roles in such systems entangled as current processes of globalization. Last Saturday morning, National Geographic TV rebroadcast a recent television documentary in which the people figured the Ink and Code webisode for it is online at the site for the series Ancient X-Files on the National Geographic channel. There's a link to the webisode on my Pinterest site. The show features the work of Sabine Highland, an Andean ethno-historian who, like others, is attempting to decode Hebrew. She comments herself online on the webisode, as do various of her colleagues and students. Her particular share of Hebrew knowledge has come from working with one of the only two currently known to scholars, Hebrew alphabetic texts, recently discovered, just in the last couple of years, Hebrew boards with both not strings and apparently corresponding alphabetic writing. The only something as close to that elusive model of decipherment, the Rosetta Stone, as scholars have found so far today. Who knows what about various Hebrews and when? We will have to keep returning to this question across worlds, temporalities, and knowledge agencies. It's a transdisciplinary question, one that does not assume that objects are unitary, that knowledges are universal or expert, or that times are not interactively in contact really with each other. In the 70s, US scholars Marcia and Robert Asher demonstrated just how a decimal numeric reading 
a specific counting keeper works. They began a process of collecting data of material significance, and what data is of material significance is something that's changed over these decades. On every surviving keeper, at that time, in museums across Europe and North and South America, a process continued since by Burton and Brzezine. The Asher code books are in e-format available for download today, and the Harvard database site is still in operation, although Brzezine is no longer its manager. Brzezine has also worked with anthropologist Frank Solomon, who has documented on the web the current display and ceremonial use of Kipu in Rapaz, Peru, where a storehouse of Kipu still exists in community. And that's a picture there of, the, of Solomon's site and of this particular storehouse. These differ strikingly from the Inca Kipu described by Erton, not in decimal array for sure, but rather full of objects that are tied onto a single cord. In some communities of practice, is it fun, a kind of serious play, to consider Kipu even as something called today design fiction? And then wonder for whom and how. My fellow alum of the program I got my PhD in, the History of Consciousness, and director of the Near Future Laboratory Online, Julian Bleeker, asks, quote, how do you entangle design, science, fact, and fiction, remember fiction is making the problem, in order to create this practice called design fiction that hopefully provides different, undisciplined ways of envisioning new kinds of environments, artifacts, and practices. Design fiction is making things that tell stories. And if we believe Burton, people are things that tell stories. Specialist in ancient technologies, Heather Luckman, teaches her undergrads at MIT about textiles as engineering materials. And recently they made a giant kipu in order to explore fiber as the fundamental Andean technology. Computer scientist Carrie Kahalios heads the social spaces group at the University of Illinois, working out new ways visualizations and physical space can shape interactive media. Photo Kipu is a group project made with grad student Cora Boggan that uses Kipu knot and cord positions to connect collective interactive photo albums that narrate social transactions. You can see a brief Kipu video in the media section of my talk site made by eco-artist and film poet Cecilia Vicuña, or her website linked in the bibliography to her set of installations and performance pieces on the menstrual kipu, or streams of blood. In the introduction to his book, The Chord Keepers, about Andean cultural continuities, multivalent and multitemporal, anthropologist Frank Solomon speaks of Kipus in search of contexts and vice versa. What would writing have to mean to include what we, who is this we, may perhaps know about the Kipu uh, so far? What does this something called a Kipu have to teach us, which us, about thingness. And what sorts of temporalities do we need to share with Kipu in order to figure with them or to figure them out? They seemingly have their own temporalities to teach us. Kipu can be 
understood for us as interrogations themselves about assumptions embedded in all of these. As agents for and of knowledge play. Anthropologist Solomon likens them to infographics. But he means by this to suggest that he who have a sort of agency that we reserve for only one side of that gap, we think we jump across to create a representation or to engage in making. Kipu possibilities in play today consider how writing might operate as a system or maybe better, several interacting systems, each with alternative layers of semiosis mapped onto or perhaps better, mapping themselves together with other objects and features of the world than words. Indeed, some never verbalize. This is a picture of Solomon, but Solomon did work on these um, sort of tally sticks that he uses to talk about what writing about words can mean. Some of the most exciting rethinkings of Kipu today involve what we might call workarounds for what we might still want to mean by writing. The Andes then become a multi-temporal geopolitical zone for considering writing without words. The title to a groundbreaking book on alternative literacies in Mesoamerica and the Andes. Solomon points out, quote, the fact that data can be formulated as speech is not the point. The Kipokamayo process could have compacted social process into an impressively data-dense medium whose clarity did not depend upon expansion into words. Well, how would that work? Caringly working out in, frankly, great detail, <laughs> bits of who knows what over which ranges of Andean cultural continuities. Solomon and the court keepers pays close attention to the transpositions of content over time across different or among different historical people that share worlds with us. Such continually re-enveloping temporalities that keep them now impress upon us flickering among progressive chronologies, wormhole simultaneities, cyclical coincidences, and other time-traveling ecologies. And Solomon tries to give us examples of a whole range of temporalities that are possible. They re this all requires us to cultivate the sort of knowledge making that Bruno Latour reminds us has never been modern. The past presents, all in one word strung together, of binary coding allow us to play extensively and transcontextually at the very same time that they urge us to finer and finer grains of detail, carefully textured and textile. Solomon asks us to consider Kipus as, quote, an immensely consequential data writer. Data writing is a term that emerges from current data analytic practices, which today play consciously among sensory modalities, taking for granted, say, data visualizations, or even data sonifications, or data dramatization, and you'll find on the web data textilization. Presumably, the people who does all of these and more. Solomon and others working out among Andean writings without words extensively connect across time and technologies, forms in which processing information does not have to jump a gap created by ideas about language. In chapter after chapter, Solomon teaches us how to understand in this kind of detail a highly complex and multiply embedded Andean system of social organization. But he's interested especially in changes across and since the 
Incan Empire through continuities. Both hierarchical, but also contingently collective among possible groupings. So this is one that has different kinds of interactivities possible with each range of connection that you're attending to, as well as altered in cycles that don't recur in any simple way. And this is one of um, Solomon's points, is to have to think about cyclical activity that's not easily understood as recurrent. And one always imperfectly known in any time period to any set of people, both cooperative and also idiosyncratic. He calls Kipu in this context, quote, reciprocity made visible. But he means by this something more variantly sensible than vision, as they, quote, allow one to use different parts of the sensorium for grasping the different variables. In pairs, and used differently at different moments of social and ritual purpose, in some parts of their use cycle, he describes kipu as simulation devices, and at other parts of the cycle, as agents in the performance of duties and entitlements. The kind of aboutness here is not representational, but rather a kind of recursive relational agency both of and about reciprocities in these kind of worldly processes. Solomon understands Kipu and Pears worked as both simulation devices nodded and unnodded for projection, planning, enactment, and reenactment, and also as records of how things have happened, with whom, when, with what informational needs, and sometimes as agencies traveling worlds. Semiotically heterogeneous is what cultural studies scholar Galen Brokaw calls Kipu, Kipu contexts and Kipu techniques. That different Kipu developed at different levels of society over time, but worked at historical moments simultaneously across worlds means that both standardization and idiosyncrasy existed among Hebrew literacy. And that doubleness is one of the most difficult things to grasp about Hebrew and what has the power to alter what we mean by writing. In other words, uh, according to Brokaw, the existence of different levels or domains of Hebrew literacy often employed different types of conventions and exhibited different degrees of standardization based on the nature and relationship among the institutions functioning in each domain. So who knows what about various Hebrew women? This is the last slide, one page. Let's return to this question across worlds, temporalities, and knowledge agencies. Now, I would argue that it is not by accident that semiotically heterogeneous Hebrew become interesting to so many, so extensively, at a time period in which it is to our own advantage to come to terms with our own practices of semiotic heterogeneity. Keep who live with us now in media ecologies that are not an area of study only, but the very air we breathe, quite as much a part of global ecologies as global warming, if also ambivalently politically charged and attended to. Media ecologies include the hormonal and neurological circuits within and extending beyond human bodies, along lines of ecological action and distributed even what we might call social media learning takes place across whole systems, not just in human heads. Mass and burgeoning new media have many demonstrations for any of us moving among knowledge worlds 
of what we might work with as trans contextualities. And political affects come necessarily to shape work now and in and about academies, examining like budgetary crises, how we get funding for particular kinds of knowledge making, you know, whether we're going to be on Coursera. A post-humanities emerges out of a political, intellectual, and affective double bind of having both to address many diverging audiences simultaneously under the threat of survival, while also having to offer knowledges as merely one of multiple agencies with very limited control. And the Hebrew actually helps us think about that double bind. In such an environment, the mapping of messages onto audiences becomes increasingly tricky as authorial and receptive agencies, partial and highly distributed, require effective labors not simply anchored by human bodies, although also sifting among authoritative and alternative knowledges and attempting to clarify affiliations or to inspire trust. Solomon speaks of sharing agency with Hipu that, quote, never ceased to be updated, never stopped changing, and therefore never ceased to be of, quote, live interest. How to share agency with and among things as things ourselves is a kind of design fiction that Hipu help us to narrate in an ecology we want to begin to inhabit Thinking of that, like, well, it's great, like, we cannot decide for Kipus, and it's kind of like Kipus and Utopia, right? Like, it can mean anything you want, basically, right now, so, I don't know, like, I mean, kind of Well, it can mean saying. anything you want, but it can mean many things you want. Exactly, so, yeah. I don't know, how do you go with it, I mean, and sometimes it's like, also, not only Kipus and not all the Andes, why I use the word design fiction, because in a way that's not quite the same thing as utopia, but it does certainly allow for a lot of making going on. Can I ask a question? Maybe this is like a speaking from kind of anthropology. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, there's been, you know, anthropology as it's also a really effective Native people mm -hmm. who consider themselves yeah. to be Native people. So the whole question about appropriate so and what do you think about that? Well, I mean, I'm wondering what you think about it <laughs> in terms of, you know, putting these, um, the Hebrew in databases or even your own website or you using them in a particular way which is not authentic, right? To however that might be kind of defined well, or thought about. But definitely for some people that would be And those an would issue. be the intensive knowledge communities that I would say mm -hmm. have very important investments in particular meanings, definitions, and boundedness, mm -hmm. authenticity, and interest. And of course, none of those things are natural either. Authenticity is created and made. It's part of a colonial heritage. It's, so none of those things are, I mean, not claiming that someone else has culturally appropriated your thing mm -hmm. d 
denies that you may not, I mean, how much of it is your thing. Mm -hmm. The kipu is so clearly not anyone's one thing. So, so that doesn't mean that cultural appropriation is meaningless. It means that it's multi-meaningful. Right. So, I mean, to what extent is, or how do the for, different forms of appropriation play into that? Is it different to look at a photograph than if I go to a community and like take the kipu and bring it to my museum? Well, until recently, all the kipu that we knew about were in museums. Uh -huh. And they had all been taken from grave sites. They had all been appropriated. There were a few in Latin America, but frankly, most of them were in Germany, <laughs> in two big museums in Germany. So, so the, the current knowledges of Kipu are totally inside of cultural appropriation. There is no non-appropriation of Kipu. The one possibility is maybe, maybe is perhaps a, a question here. I mean, we might maybe say that this particular storehouse of Kipu in La Paz, maybe that's not culturally appropriated, except I would think you might have to work really hard to make that happen. So picking up on the question, how, and I apologize for being late, so I missed the very beginning of your Oh, well, don't worry about it. Um, so I missed some of the, the framing of it, but what do local um, folks think about all of this international interest in the people? And that's not something that I personally know. Now, Reggie, I don't know. Reggie, well, I, I want to speak to that. Make it the same as yeah. I understand it. Um, Depends on what counts as local, for one yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. This group is not using them. They used them a generation ago. Yes. Yeah. It, uh, they're so not using they're, them today. As far as I know, you may have yeah. done more recent research. I don't think there's anyone really using it um, in the sense that they were. It's frankincense. It's yeah. more of a ceremonial object that's slung across. He said it became a ceremonial object over the last two generations. But they're not. They're not actually touching it or looking at it, and you know. Performing history, or performing any kind of bureaucratic um, knowledge display, and correct? it's not clear whether these particular people would ever have been used for that right. anyway. Right. So, so that's there the is other that issue. distinction. Yeah. Because yeah. I, you know, to me, from the little that I mean, I, I did a lot of work a number of years ago, but it's the relationships are the mathematical relationships. Ashers, who originally worked on it, established, were really fascinating. Yeah. But what, you know, and we do have we do have one colonial Kipu mm -hmm. where it's a tribute list, and they have the they have the actual um, Kipu and tribute. Uh, right, there's right. just one of those. There's just one. But that obviously um, is a colonial kind of invention too. And that's before we found the Kipu boards. Mm -hmm. But you have worked on people used for um, confessions. Yeah, remembrance. Yeah. So of course, there was a different belief system for the Spanish that invaded the Andes. And uh, the priests had to teach the indigenous peoples how to confess and become Christians. Well, this was kind of hard because there was not this thing called the sin, right? There weren't the Ten Commandments, and they had to teach um, what these commandments were and then how to come and confess once a year. And so we have records of kipus being used to keep track of these confessions. Some of you are Catholic, I guess. Uh, you have to not only know what your sin is, but how many times you committed it. And you have to think back thoroughly over the past year of all the sins that you've committed. So uh, we have these incredible tales of uh, one priest complaining about the indigenous people coming with their kipus, and somebody who's confessing sexual sins passing this kipu back to a young kid, right, who's also converted. And this kid is confessing all these sexual sins as well, because they're there on the kipus, right? And I think it was up until about the 50s when one priest was telling me that 
there still were kikus being used, small ones, for sins. I've forgotten the exact correspondence, but the sins that were reported, it was both in the Christian religion and um, Quechua belief to respect your parents. This is because of what you were getting to talk about the elaborate kinship patterns, but we can understand you know, respecting your parents. That was definitely one on there. But, but some other very strange um, kind of things, like um, hitting, you, hitting someone like this, right, would be one of the sins that was often uh, confessed to the priest. So it's, it, but that would be one of the things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's an example mm -hmm. of what Brokaw was trying to talk about is the semiotic heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. That here we've got the Hebrew, which can be used in a standardized way, but also an idiosyncratic way, and that it can travel where one person can read off of what another person did, but there's also an element in which you have to, it's part of your own mm -hmm. meaning of it. Mm -hmm. So this is one, it's this particular set of semiotic heterogeny that's what always made the Kifu not writing in the history of so-called true writing, that and it's not being mapped directly onto a, a, a kind of system of phonology. Um, but now we have widened our understanding of writing. And there's actually, I could go into more on that in its relation to counting, but, but, but there's a whole different history of writing today. But also, as you were, like when you were saying dramatization, I mean, that would be a, yeah. right, a play is something that can be written down, but it also can, so it can be acted. I mean, that's mm -hmm. very parallel to exactly. what, what you're yeah. saying. But people, or I was even just thinking yesterday, I mean, you're, we're in a meeting, and someone's taking notes, right? I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's always mm -hmm. that relationship between the performance and the mm -hmm. text also. But I was wondering in particular, sort of also, in this terms of the appropriation about the materiality sure. of it, I mean, the object itself is only one. Although it can be copied, right? I mean, it can be materially copied by someone. Well, it can, but it can also be digitally copied. And is, are are there differences? I mean, is there a difference to actually put it on my shoulder versus looking on, looking at it? In terms of these questions around, you know, culture and appropriation. Well, I have some ideas about that, but I'd really be interested in what other people thought about that. I don't want to, like, you know be the only person speaking because I know that there are other people here who know stuff about Kifu or have their own knowledges that they'd like, that they can connect to. I can't address mine, but I feel they have a major knot and then they come down to subsidiary. It's very hierarchical. And I can imagine the, the design of this Kifu, the original design, the classic, classical design of it, is being used to describe kinship, patriarchal kinship. I can understand the similarity. But if I'm going to use this the structure of this design to describe writing strategy in, in the internet, Thank you. 
what is that called? Ari, uh, algorithm. Algorithm? Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes it's just based on the usage of the internet. So like, if I just pull out my account um, from this past past five years, how I use uh, Google uh, the server to access data, I can really, if I really pull it out and uh, how you spread it in a red graphical. I also can see the knots and the connection and the structure. And also people, even if people equal to knots, and knots for me is not just connection, it's also entanglement. It's also like it's a complex, it's something like difficult. But the difficulty actually is also something that connects you to a bigger level. So I just want to know more about that. Well, first of all, I would say um, I don't think that uh, information is immaterial. So I come from a sort of school of understanding information technologies in which they are materialities. So what looks like, oh, it's a screen. Well, I'm sorry. It's a computer that somebody made and it's filled with all kinds of materialities and it's part of like an international factory system, and people made the silicon chips. I mean, that's not immaterial. That's deeply material. So, so first of all, that's what I would say. There isn't anything immaterial here. Um, second of all, the issue about representation or metaphor, um, that's actually what Solomon is trying to call into question, is this whole business about the notion of what's a representation and its gapness from the world, just like we're just saying now about the materiality of the information structures. So what Solomon is trying to offer in this sense of this data writing is a kind of writing that doesn't have to be mediated, in this case through words, that's the writing without words part, that it's about, it's a kind of writing that is itself a piece of the world that it's about. People are both about and things, things to think with and about. They're not metaphors. They are the things they represent. There's something very interesting about that at this moment in understanding what data writing and data analytics are and what parts of the sensorium that we use for cognition and the degrees to which we imagine cognition and its relationality to words. I mean, that's all of what Solomon is trying to work with and work through. That's a kind of materialism, a new materialism. So people have a very interesting role to play in the design fiction of new materialism. Yes, design fiction, fiction, fictio, making, you know, appropriation. It's not at all clear that in that sense that there's anything that isn't appropriated. That doesn't mean that there couldn't be ethical and, and important political meanings around who gets to use what people went in there and for what purposes and who gets to say it's theirs. Those are all definitely political questions, but there isn't an obvious ownership there. The questions matter, the politics matter. There isn't an obvious answer to them. So the, the cognitive aspect is really interesting. Oh, it's yes. fascinating. Um, you know, I, I, besides keepers, I've looked at potatoes. Oh, yes, you know how yes. Many potatoes, different kinds of potatoes there are in Bolivia and Peru, right? About 3,000. Oh, really? And so there's the Interna International Potato Center, mm -hmm. which is collecting glass slides of all of those, just in case future <laughs> problems, right? So, and, and, and the question is, is this biopiracy or is this an right. arc? So or people have tried to whole bunch of things. things. I mean, Talk about cultural your, appropriation. Your yeah. question. You know. right. And the social construction of space, too. I mean, Absolutely. I, I, I get your point about materiality, but to put it on my shoulder like this and dance with 
my people. Well, I mean, it implies a certain construction of. I know, yeah. and yet that's only one kipu. There are other kipus which you can't do that with. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. what I'm fascinated is, is uh, the number of scientists and linguists who have talked to farmers who can keep yeah. track of 25 <laughs> different decisions on what they're going to plant, which potato they're going to plant, going by altitude, how fast it cooks, whether it's salty or grainy. Um, you know, what is the best seed potato? I mean, they go through all these things, and they also have in their mind um, what fields they have. And granted, this century, these fields are much more reduced than possibly they were before. But another interesting aspect for thinking about patterning, cognitive patterning, is uh, some studies that have been done on um, uh, 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 not alphabetically trained, use that phrase, okay, herders who can keep track, and this is without keepers, of 500 different animals in their herd, okay, and they keep track of them by saying, okay, uh, that one has the white nose and the black hind foot, you know, and going into that degree of detail for all the colors, the different patterning markings, uh, whether it's a male or female, whether it's a a young one or an older one, you know, all this patterning is going on on 500 different levels. And uh, just that kind of Andean patterning is fascinating to me and to have people talk about it. Well, and this is, this point that you're making here, I mean, first of all, the issue about um, people keeping track of this incredible range of different enveloped patterns, and that's where you have to understand hierarchy. And in fact, this is not logocentrism. Logocentrism is actually about uh, uh, the mapping of words onto language in a particular way. That's, the, that's what logocentrism means. But it's not about hierarchical power. But when, um, when Solomon is talking about these tally sticks, he actually is trying to talk about how to write power. So these tally sticks are set up to, as a kind of writing that shows these relations between different actors within a particular organizational structure and, their, and, and the kind of power that they map together. And the tally sticks are done yearly in, at this moment where everyone's role is set up in this organization. And the notches are made in a way that people never discuss what they're doing. They just pass them around until everybody's got the right stick and it's clear that we now know who's going to be doing what. And, and he claims that this has to do with, with a kind of indication of the power relationships that they have. This is actually a very simple writing of that word. The one, the potato one, is another one that would be another level of, of complexity. Solomon is theorizing that the kipu is for another order of complexity beyond the potato complexity. And it has to do with um, group entitlements and obligations that map in these cycles of different levels of social organization that also include things like who's got what fields, who's getting which potatoes or whatever. But it also includes, he claims, things like practicing in a ritual practice in which um, entitlements are, are given out to people in a ritual moment that actually is not just about the world we live in, but some other worlds that at that moment come into connection with the people. I mean, in a very cosmological sense. So, and that go together with, you know, uh, ritual practices of various kinds. So we really are talking about literally worlds coming together through people. That's part of what Solomon is trying to actually get us to think about in this very specific set of historical circumstances. And then to notice how we do that in ways that we never know we do that. So red 
that he is the one who actually turned me on to a great deal of this, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Can I add something? I see that about this design fiction, if it is the writing strategy, if, if you look at it as an issue of language, but if you look at Larry Strauss, if you look at the structure of language itself, the binary code, this really would be an alternative to that. So this would be, this would, this would uh, challenge that set of anthropological assumptions. So how do you think this trans contextuality of this design fiction can give us new insights to post-structuralist thinking of logocentrism? It's a critique of representation. Logocentrism itself has some elements of a critique of representation and in other ways depends upon so, and I would say, to be very literal about it, this is where you can get into the business about the notion of the history of writing and counting, which goes back to the potatoes. Um, what I was trying to get back here to was a link on the website. Let me get back to the website here. Um, uh, Denise Schmuck Besserat is uh, a historian who is known for having done work on the relationship in, Me in Mesopotamia of counting and writing. So this is a relatively recent set of histories of writing that somewhat alter what we thought about writing in the past. And what Schmuck Besserat's work was about um, let's see if we can go to her website here. Let's see. Um, sort of like the potato. But what she's got is she shows that some of the early cuneiform packages, if you open them up, what they have are little tokens. So that early writing starts by saying, you know, you have seven little tokens of sheep them in a package, and then you write on the outside seven sheep. So, I mean, that's actually a very crude way of saying it, but she's got, she has this whole history of showing you how the tokens work, how this kind of relationship operates, in which the writing and the objectness and the thingness are all sort of folded in on each other, and the counting is essentially what writing is about that counting and writing come together. So this is one way of thinking of that origin. But the kipu actually offers us a very radically different set of sensory apparatus. So you can see that little clay tokens put into clay packages have one kind of sensory apparatus. Some of the recent excavations we may have found kipu that are as old as 5,000 I'm not sure these are like proto kipu so this is very speculative. But that's essentially around the same time that writing, like cuneiform, was happening in Mesopotamia. This is happening in South America. We're talking about two very different locations in which an entirely different apparatus of, the sen of our sensorium, our sensory apparatus, is mapping in another way. So this is what the kipu offers as this alternative history of writing. And it partly is a cognitive sensory package that's not the same as what we used to call true writing coming out of Mesopotamia. And so Shmat Besserat's work has this stuff happening in Mesopotamia, but it's clearly what partially influenced the Ashers as they tried to think through what counting on the kipu meant. And it's part of what got Burton to think about what binary coding means. And of course, because we know so much more about binary coding now, we could see it in the past in a way that we hadn't really seen it in that before. No, I mean, I was, I, this is interesting. I was just thinking about then how new technologies come about reflecting some of the imperatives for Absolutely. this intertextuality, like photogra photography exhibit in a museum, right? Which yeah. has like the picture of 
something that refers to something else, but then we also have the caption of it, right? So there's a way in which the writing refers to a visual reference, which is also referring to something Exactly. Else. And there's something, too, going on now about the way that we have started to uh, um, to think about data and its and its sensory packaging with us, with us, not as a representation or a metaphor, but with us, and that's like the edge that's really hard to sort of think about. But that's the edge that you might call the design fiction. That's the critique of representation. And it's so interesting now that we're going to have this printing of three-dimensional objects, right? Yeah. And just we have one like in that here at Maryland, we have a 3D printer here. It becomes impossible. We can make things without having to consider the representation of the things that we are using it to do. And that's what we've got here, is exactly the way to try to think about that. Oh, it seems to me that we need to pay some attention to the context here. Yeah. That to try to study the Hebrew, that it's a very context type of thing, and that's why I was curious how they were locally viewed, but then again, I'm an anthropologist, so of course we're obsessed with context. Um, I think also I was thinking in terms of the potato example, just how important local knowledge is, and for us it may seem like such an odd thing to understand the distinction between each of these types of potatoes and what their uses are and where they grow, but that within a local context, that is the knowledge, regardless of whether people read or write in any type of traditional Western sort of a way. And that, um, and one other thing I was gonna say just about the critique of post-structuralism, I think we need to move beyond Lady Strauss a bit. And I, I think I was working on Dorita, one of the okay. novels in that's another conversation that could be very interesting. Yeah. Well, see, this is why I think that transdisciplinarity is so important at this point, because I think that it can honor these intensive, intensive meanings that are local, but recognize that these objects are not unitary and they don't just exist locally, or they exist translocally. I mean. That is as much a fact as its context. The context, you know, we're, I mean, we, we've got more temporalities than a single context, spatio-temporal, cultural, whatever. And the anthropology itself is struggling right now exactly with that edge. For a while there, we thought, oh yes, we can just be good and be vocal. We can be culturally appropriate. We won't steal anybody else's thing. Well, it can't do that. It actually doesn't work. That isn't how things operate. We know better than that. So what else is there? And how do you honor that intensive caring and also know that that's not the only reality? And the kipus are about realities piling on top of each other. We go to talk about global. Right? Yes, and well, global is an interesting way to do it. Yeah. I do stuff on global in my book. Uh -huh. Yeah. I so my book on transdisciplinary stories has a lot of stuff about globalization. Okay. Yeah. I have to thank you for introducing me to these things, people. Mm -hmm. And actually, I can understand that transcontextuality is very much also referring to context not as origin of things, mm -hmm. but context like if you look at coffee, coffee are being drink, being uh, used and being drank and being produced in so many different locations, different communities. If we still want to use the colonial history to look at coffee where it was found, and would we use that as consider the origin of coffee and use that as co local context? And all the other are not context, but they are being manipulated. Mm -hmm. Then, very difficult for us to understand the concept of trans con contextuality. Con trans contextuality actually want to challenge the idea of the origin. I understand it. But it just uh, just now the, the design of the people itself really troubled me about cognitive patterns, about binaries, because in your theorizing
realizing you also use binary code. That's why I would like to understand how you use it. Because my understanding of binary logos has been very much going down. When I look at it, binary yeah. here is a local context. It's not the underlying underlying universal cognitive process. That's why it's not Levi Strauss. It is not rationality. It is, it is not. It is about a particular cosmology in a particular cultural location that has a multi-temporal zone I mean, and then that especially comes through when you talk about the color, right? It's yeah. like, what was the binary there? I mean, something we would never think of as being. I know, binary. it's so cool. <laughs> yeah. I happen to love yeah. that part too. Because the color. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. yeah, I think that's an amazing thing. And the, it, it, I, it just astonishes me that Burton could do this. I can't imagine how he came up with this. Part of it is he's an ethnomathematician, he went and apprenticed himself to a set of grandmothers who do dyeing in order to learn the context of a particular set of binary codes of colors. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just an amazing set of ethnographic uh, principles. I mean, it, the ethnography here is fascinating stuff. And, you know, to go and look at it in detail, I mean, I just totally recommend Solomon's book, The Court Keepers. It just is filled with amazing detail. And so many people have ventured into it because I've been involved with this project. Um, this S and Z flying and which is so cool <laughs> came out of an architect, um, Bill Conkle. He yeah. was looking at it, right? Who's here um, from Mar uh, from Washington D.C. He lives in Washington. Yeah, yeah. and uh, then we have Carol Mackey looking at herders because still in the '50s herders were using small pieces, right? Mm -hmm. And working from that mathematicians, like the Ashers, are still involved in this. And they work on reading phone books as a kind of huge taboo, right, to try to push the analogy there. So you have people, and then Frank Solomon is particularly good because he is a first class Quechua speaker. Oh gosh, he's as And so he has, from the language, I mean, there is one word, I know you know um, Pachamama, right? That Pacha does not just mean, you know, earth. It has a much bigger context in textiles of uh, time and space and the unification of that. And so often in my wildest dreams, I think that we're not maybe seeing the kikus correctly. You know? I think this They're is not it. held like this. That yeah. The drawings yeah. we have from that are, are from somebody, uh, Waman Palma, who's done about, you know, 1580 or 1613. Yeah. And so maybe they were really in a more circular, where you have a multi-dimensional aspect to them. I don't know how you. I think they have to have them, been, you know. Multi-dimensional. But uh, yeah. I mean, my husband is a mathematician, so I try to get him to talk about stuff like string theory. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just not going to this. But I think this multi-multi-temporal dimensionality is something we we still don't quite. Well, I don't understand. And this is where you and I had, when we had our interview, that my one and only interview so far with with scholars of Kiku. What we're and we were talking about the legal cases. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Or not. When I was asked yeah. in Ecuador to yeah. uh, participate in a legal case where the indigenous peoples in the tropical parts of Ecuador were involved in a case with the oil companies, right, and cleaning up. And they were presenting their dreams, what we would call dreams, as part of their legal case. Because in the tropical forest, the Quechua speakers that are there, there is no separation between what we would call this reality here on Earth and their dreams, okay? Dreams are reality as well. So they were arguing for this uh, to be accepted in the legal case. And it's, it's really fascinating. Think of that um, within the legal sphere. But I think one of the interesting things, like even in this in this discussion, Katie, is um, because 
I mean, the, the sort of dialogue here between kind of anthropology and its notion of the local, which I don't think anyone here really of subscribes course, to, but, course, but, yeah. but there's a part of that that we're, is very familiar to us. Um, and then- And just it also has an ethical implication. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, you know, something like binary, like zero and one, which we think of as somehow universal, right? So, I mean, when you put these into dialogue with one another, I mean, that's very, I think, transgressive of the forms and the disciplinary form of how, you know, local and universal are thought about in the And that economy. is why the transdisciplinary is so interesting, because it actually makes it possible to do that without, like, mushing them all together. Um, I think what's the business about the binary that I find so interesting, I, when, when the um, American Indian Museum was put together, there were uh, a number, you know, that parts of the museum are put together with these community curators, and there is a section on, um, uh, on like Cusco and Peru, and I don't know if you've seen that, with the community curators. Well, one of the community curators who came was a Paku from Cusco who talked about the spin fly relationships. That's where we got this stuff about, you know, that the, that the very clothing that you wear has a different spin fly relationship depending on your own location within a particular set of organizational and spiritual agencies. So, you know, that isn't universal. That binary is especially local, but it's also deeply cosmological. I think we have a really hard time imagining the cosmological as if it's not universal, except that of course it's local, except that of course it can be used to extensively examine things. I mean, I think that's partly what's at stake here. It's not just globalization. Localization is a piece of this, but it's the next thing after globalization. So for me, that's what transdisciplinarity helps us think about. These intense, honoring the intensive communities of practice and extensively examining and inspecting the range of possibilities. Like what other kinds of things um, I don't think will be in the book, or like what what um, like Kiku seem to be helping us think about thinness itself. Um, so I'm wondering, like, are there? I mean, other in, things in the speaking of things book. Yes. Okay. So um, a big chunk that's already been written. Uh, the thing is, I uh, I came out of doing work in anthropology and classics when I was an undergraduate. And I did work in Southeast Asia, and then I also did work on ancient Greek. And at that time, in a very levi strossian sort of way, there was a lot of work going on on what was then quite new, this the notion of the oral formula or composition and performance. And that was one of the early issues that I got very interested in as writing technologies very much a challenge to logocentrism, coming out of a kind of Derridian notion of writing, and that was very much where I started doing a lot of this work. And part of that became very clear that even the very materialities of how we constructed what counted as the oral and the written was materially formed in Bosnia, right after the Ottoman, the fall of the Ottoman Empire during a period of time in which a particular set of practices were in place to separate what was going to count as the oral and the written. And then they were universalized by placing them back into ancient Greece. And then we, were, we set up this thing called the oral formula. I mean, that was one of the aspects of this that got me into it. So a big chunk of the book is about those kind of classifications and how they come in, including things like the ways in which the classifications that we now think of coming from Marshall McLuhan actually come out of that. 
So this is in many ways a challenge to all to that particular understanding of um, of what we can call like this separation of orality and Buddhism. So the Hebrew is a really interesting object for that as well. Good. I think we're pretty much out of time, so thank you very much for a very interesting presentation and uh, conversation. Well, thank you for coming, and I hope that it wasn't too violent.